Welcome to another edition of the It Modcast podcast. I am your host, Brad Gullickson, the mouth dork, and I am alone today in the dork cave to bring you this really awesome conversation uh, with screenwriter, director, filmmaker Dan Rosen. Uh, I drove out to the Alamo Draft House Winchester this past weekend to see The Last Supper with Dan in attendance. And I got a few uh, moments to chat with him about his film. Uh, have you seen The Last Supper? Uh, you really should have, but I wouldn't be surprised if you have not. It came out in 1995. Uh, wasn't like a runaway success, but in the decades since, it has built up a little nifty cult following. Um, it stars, you know, Cameron Diaz, Annabeth Gish, Courtney B. Vance, Ron Eldred, Bill Paxton, Nora Dunn, Ron Perlman. Uh, Dan makes a cameo appearance in it. Uh, Charles Durning's in this movie. Mark Harmon's in this movie. You, you, you really should just see it for that cast alone. Uh, but at the same time, it is such a savage, savage satire. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to read you the IMDb uh, plot synopsis. It says, you know, a group of idealistic but frustrated liberals succumb to the temptation of murdering right-wing pundits for their political beliefs. I mean, damn, <laughs> that is a movie we need today. And, you know, it, it's it's not necessarily a one-sided uh, conversation around this uh, diabolical dinner table. Um, you know, the, the liberals get uh, a, a lashing as well. So, yeah, um, I really, really appreciated talking to Dan and getting this opportunity. And, you know, my thanks to Andy Geyerson, the programmer of the Alamo Winchester, for setting this up. Uh, so, you know, I don't think you necessarily need to have seen the movie to listen to this conversation. In fact, I had not seen the film for several years before sitting down with Dan, and I got to watch it after, we're, after we had this conversation. And uh, so, yeah, but, you know, go check it out. It's on Amazon, uh, I, th- I think. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's on uh, Amazon. You can rent it for three ninety nine. That's a deal and a steal. So here you go. Here's my conversation, my chat with Dan Rosen. And here we are in the Alamo Draft House Winchester up in the projection booth with their new shining carpeting. I really dig it. Uh, I'm speaking today with Dan Rosen, uh, the screenwriter behind The Last Supper, which they'll be showing tonight, uh, the filmmaker uh, behind The Curve as well, uh, and Freeloaders. Yes. Uh, um, so, Dan, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk to me. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, I have not seen The Last Supper in quite some time, so I'm really looking forward to Either watching it <laughs> with a crowd, with a 2018 crowd, too. Yeah. Uh, you know, my, my memory of the film is it's a pretty biting satire, a, a, a savage comedy. Uh, and I'm curious to see, uh, it seems like more relevant than ever now. Than exactly. it was in 1995. Yeah. Uh, so I guess where I want to start is, I mean, you know, what was your inspiration then to write the play f- first, correct? Well, technically, I don't know if it, you could call it a play or a movie. I wrote mm-hmm. it, the original draft, which I wrote in nine days in a hotel room in Reno, Nevada, Jeez. was um, I wrote it to make it. So I wrote it so it could play as a play or as a movie, but it all took place in one room. Mm-hmm. But the four, I mean, I did write it in screenplay format, not play format. And the idea was, okay, I'm, I'm going to make this no matter what. Like, because it, it seemed like it was easy. We can talk later about how I realized I made some rookie uh-huh. writer mistakes, so it, it's not the easiest. Writing a movie where people are eating dinner all the time does not lend itself to low budget always. But, um, but yeah, so that was the original idea was to put it in, uh, in one room. The inspiration was actually "You're Too Young," I think, was the Iran Contra hearings. Oh yeah, of like, was that the late '80s? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was around for it. 1979. Yeah, because yeah, Bush 87. was still <laughs> yeah. 87. Yeah, because Bush was president, right? Um, no, Reagan was president. Mm-hmm. What am I right. talking about? Yeah, and uh, that was always in the back of my head. And I always thought that was this moment where the Democrats, who I was a lifelong Democrat, was always like, "Well, wait a minute, they." Why did they let all these guys get up there and lie? Mm-hmm. And and Rush Limbaugh, that's when he kind of started. And uh, I was always thinking, like, uh, if you had those guys over for dinner, like guys like Rush Limbaugh, but also people like Oliver North and people like that, if you had them, they're clearly lying all the time. 
But if you had them over for dinner, would they lie? Mm-hmm. And then I'm not quite sure where I went from. Would they lie? And if they did lie, uh, you'd have to kill them. But uh, at some point, that that was in my head. The original draft, they killed them and they ate them. Re- that, they, would, oh, they would kill them and then cook them up for the next dinner. With, and it, I, I, I remember there was a thematic way of doing it where, like, you know, the vegetarian was given the, <laughs> the dead person who was anti-vegetarian or something. something so like how that. did that leave the script then? I it kind of never made the script. I uh-huh. think I remember – I've read, like, ten pages a day. Uh-huh. And I, re- I think it was somehow – I don't even know if I ever wrote it. I know that was the original idea, though, uh-huh, was to do something uh-huh. like that. And then in the writing of it, the cannibalism went away. Yeah, kind of. I didn't. I figured. I, I kind of didn't need it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, do you like revisiting it uh, when when you do revisit it, or even in your mind, do you see it as like in today's context as being of having this a, a, the same message? Like, has the message changed at all? In the context of the time it's being viewed in, I guess, is what I'm asking. God, I, it's funny. I always think the message is going to be dated because mm-hmm. I, I, I held on to the playwrights to it. So it's been done as a play in a number of places around the world. And, it's, and usually, like it was in Argentina, they change it so it's Argentinian politics. So mm-hmm. the French version is French politics. Mm-hmm. And I've updated it up till Obama's like, second term. I updated it maybe the last like, two years ago. Uh, I'm still too depressed to make it today because uh-huh. <laughs> it just seems too real if I write President Trump at some point. Um, but uh, every four years, I keep getting optimistic. I don't know why, thinking, oh, it's going to be different and people aren't going to be nasty to each other anymore in politics and everyone's going to be friendly and people are going to look at this as like, oh, wasn't it so quaint the way they acted back in the 90s? But it's, it's only gotten worse and what's funny is it's only got worse, and I, I, I still feel we're one step away from doing what these guys do in the movie. Well, so I, I look back at, like, 1995, and, you know, granted, I'm, I'm younger than you, 1690s, that was uh, a boom era for America and for, and for my childhood. Yeah. Like, all positive vibes. And when I watched this film originally, whereas I appreciated the... Um, the, the, the concept and the anger behind the movie, I don't think I felt that anger in 1995. Whereas in 2018, I have loads of anger. And I'm kind of excited to tackle The Last Supper with this baggage I now carry. Right. So I, so I wrote it in 93. Okay. And uh, some people have brought that up before, and I, I didn't even think about it because... We, we did a 20th anniversary screening in uh, at the Austin Film Festival, which is... Mm-hmm. I don't, have you ever yeah. been there? I have, yeah. It's, it's great. great festival. Yeah. And I um, uh, forget, very nice guy did the Q&A with me. And he brought up, and I wasn't even thinking, he said, so you wrote this in 1993, right? And I go, yeah. And he goes, so in 1993, Bill Clinton had just become president. Right. <laughs> the Democrats controlled everything, and everybody was really happy. And he said, where did this... Where did, why did you write – like, where did this come from? And then I realized that that first line of the movie is – or one of the first lines that you think about is uh, the Ron Perlman character who's like Rush Limbaugh mm-hmm. says, a storm is brewing, my friend. And I think it might be – part of it might be my Jewish heritage where when everything's going good, you know something bad's coming around the corner. <laughs> so I, I think looking back – I mean, 1993 is a long time now. Maybe I was thinking that, that things were too good mm-hmm. and something bad was go- – and. Clearly, that's exactly what happened. I remember being in Paris. I, I had a long, sto- complicated story. But I had to go to Paris on a moment's notice to deliver a videotape copy of the movie to the Cannes Film Festival Committee, who had called us on a Thursday, left a message on a voicemail. Not a voicemail. A, there was a thing that used to be called answering machines. Yeah. <laughs> and they left it an answering machine on the producer's phone on a Thursday. We were actually doing sound for the movie at the Skywalker Ranch. Oh. And they said, hey... We're halfway through your movie, and the tape broke, and we really like it, but we can't put it in without seeing the whole thing. Can you please get someone to bring a copy? And we couldn't mail it because of the postal and a FedEx strike oh at the God. same time. So I happened to be traveling with my passport, so they put me on a plane uh, to go to Paris on a moment's notice to deliver the tape. Now, unfortunately, we ended up not going in. But that weekend I was going there, and I forgot if it was during the week or literally when I landed – was the Oklahoma City bombing. Oh, yeah. 
And then all of a sudden there's this Timothy McVeigh guy who literally looks and talks like Bill Paxton uh-huh. for the movie. And so it's funny. Now when I describe the movie and I say, oh, they invite this guy that Bill Paxton playing kind of like a Timothy McVeigh type. And then I realize, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. I, no, it's a Bill huh. – Timothy McVeigh with the Bill it's Paxton, Bill Paxton type, type, right? Yeah. Interesting, interesting. Um, you know, I was reading – uh, Roger Ebert's review of the film uh, earlier today. Yeah. And he praised it on being a very partisan film. And I don't think I ever saw it as like saying, of, of seeing both sides. But I guess as the film progresses, you are sticking it a little bit to the liberals as well. No, yeah. I've, I haven't read that review in a long yeah, time. Yeah. Did, when he said partisan, did he mean was I pro liberal, pro. Yeah, I, I, pro I, liberal. I, pro, pro liberal, yeah, yeah. Well, one of my proudest moments is finding out that this film is like conservatives love this film and it's, to many of them they, they think they're the heroes of it uh-huh. there was a when they, they did an off off Broadway or off 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 Broadway production in New York and one of the reviews from Breitbart was Dan okay. Rosen is a conservative genius he's managed to trick these I believe they said gay liberal probably Jewish actors in New York City to put on a play that they think makes fun of conservatives but really makes fun of them mm. um that's like my proudest review <laughs> and uh and i don't think it's completely wrong it's so funny how people well i guess people seeing this is no spoiler alerts but yeah we're gonna have spoilers right this. if you haven't watched the last supper you need to do that now yeah but people who watch the film and they're like oh you know the liberals are totally the heroes of the thing really because you're killing a lot of people mm-hmm. and i don't the, the right-wing people aren't really killing anybody until the end where the right wing people yeah he kills people but he's killing the bad guy he's killing the murderers Mm -hmm. so uh, you know a lot of people think uh, I mean I am definitely liberal but they they think that I wrote this it's it's not Mm -hmm. anti-conservative and it's not anti I guess it's a combination of both so when you when you were writing it in those nine days are you taking a side with any of the characters uh my favorite character was well, – I really like Pollock, but was uh, – who Cameron Diaz ended up playing the character. It was going to be Janine Garofalo. Oh, really? Yeah. And oh, I wrote interesting. It, and I wrote it for her. And, she, and, now there, and there was also six roommates. The original draft were six roommates. Huh. And the six roommate who got cut name was Daniel. And I wanted to play that part, shockingly. <laughs> um, David Cross played it in the stage reading mm-hmm. and was great. But then the director and the producer realized we had to cut a roommate out, mm-hmm. and he ended up getting cut. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay. Huh. So, you know, you're writing this film. It's called The Last Supper. All the characters are named variations of apostles. Right. Um, I mean, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, you have a Jewish background. I mean, is there, was it like all excitement? Because it seems like it comes out in a big burst. Was there any anxiety or worry about what you were crafting in that screenplay? Of how it was going to be interpreted? Oh, no. no. Nothing at all. Mm-hmm. But, man, that was a good question. It deserves a better answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about since it's released? You know, I was um, – gosh, I can't remember what the paper was. But, like, in 2011, you sh- uh, you had a stage uh, production in Wisconsin, right? Oh, in Madison. Right. And the review spawned, like, all these online – uh, death threats. Yeah, de- yeah, death threats. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and you know, very wh- exciting. What's that experience like? It, awesome. <laughs> uh, I was going there for that second week. Have you ever been to Madison, by the way? I have not. God, no, it's a great. I love college mm-hmm. towns. It's mm-hmm. a great college. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I did the production the first week. It's a great. It was a great production. And I came in to do Q and A. And Nora Dunn, who's in the movie, mm-hmm. she also flew in uh, for us to do Q and A together. They didn't have death threats against her, which is me. Um, <laughs> And also the funny part is, uh, you know, I'm, no one knows what I look. No one knows who I am, but they they know I'm somebody when I have a like six eight, bald, you know, literally a guy who could have played Zach in the movie mm-hmm. with a gun on his belt, mm-hmm. uh, sitting next to me the whole time. Um, but yeah, that was crazy. I think the review it was in like the the liberal Madison like weekly or whatever. Yeah. And I think all they said was, like, hey, this is the. This is a good idea. Now, it's this a is, super positive review. Yeah. When you read the review, it's like, you know, thumbs up. This is a great yeah. production, a great And I think concept. they kind of made a joke, like, because remember, this is Scott Walker, Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. And actually, I was telling uh, my friends that the next day, we closed on a Sunday. On Monday, those rallies started outside the, the state capitol. 
And our theater was is on the mall. That's where they started, on the mall. All the TV stations used our theater as their staging huh. uh, for all their ins and outs. Uh-huh. And that started, the, that was like a month-long protest against Scott Walker. So I think that was talking about that that reporter was making a comment about how bad Wisconsin was yeah, and, and like yeah. this is probably a good idea like invite these invite right wing assholes to dinner and kill them <laughs> and it feeds the beast that was happening there yeah so I wanted to specifically talk about Bill Paxton the you know, late great Bill Paxton yeah, one of my all time favorite actors yeah. period um, and you know he has a critical role in The Last Supper yeah working with him what was that experience well it's a crazy kind of story about Bill Paxton, a twofold story. One, he's one of the first people I met in L.A. I was working on a comedy show on the old – it was called the Ha Channel before Comedy Central. And I was at a Thanksgiving party. I don't know I, – I want to say it was 92, but he remember he was in the Predator sequel? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Predator 2. Predator 2. I love Predator 2. We so, love Predator 2 on this podcast. So I was, at, I was at a Thanksgiving dinner in Venice. I didn't really know anybody. I'd come with a friend. He was friends with everybody. He was talking to everybody. And then there was this other guy there who wasn't talking to anyone, Bill Paxton. Uh-huh. And I started talking to him, and I had known him. I know everyone knew him from Weird Science. It was Weird Science. Yeah, Weird Science, yeah. But I had never seen Weird Science. But I knew him from, like, Near Dark. Oh, yeah. And, and I thought he was – I just always liked him a lot. So he and I hit it off and we're talking or whatever. And I said to him, I said, hey, are you – Aren't you like in that movie? Aren't you in Predator Two? That, that's open. That's open tonight. And he goes, Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I go, Well, have you seen it yet? He goes, No, I haven't seen it with the audience. He goes, I kind of want to go. And he goes, I go, Well, why don't we go right now? And he goes, What are you talking about? It's Thanksgiving. I'm like, Yeah. I go, But you don't know anybody here. I don't know anybody here. Let's just. And he didn't have a car. I, I don't know if he was not living in there or whatever. And he said, uh, Shoot, let's just take a cab. By the way, for listeners of the podcast, uh, before Uber and Lyft, <laughs> there used to be a thing called cabs and taxis. Ooh. And we got in a taxi, and we went to the Avco Theater on Wilshire Boulevard in Westwood. This is when Westwood was, like, gang territory. And we go there, and it's a very rough crowd, and we're watching Predator 2. And then people start noticing that it's the guy in the movie, who, by the way, gets his head cut off, I, I believe, am, in the movie. Yeah. And everyone's like, look at Bill Paxton. So I got to watch, spend this crazy night watching Bill Paxton, watching himself on a big screen with this big, <laughs> great audience, you know, reacting to the movie. And, and he, like did he enjoy the movie? Was he a Oh, fan? yeah. He, oh, my God. He, it was great. <laughs> and then I kind of, like, lost touch with him. And then he was in a movie called One False Move. Remember oh, One False it's Move? a great movie. He's a great movie. Yeah. He plays a sheriff. Do you remember the sheriff's mm-hmm. name? Uh, I don't. Sheriff's name is Wes. Okay. Might even be Wes Stanley, but it's Wes. In when I wrote The Last Supper, I loved that character. Uh-huh. And the sheriff in the original Last Supper, the character's name is Wes. Huh. It's him. It's the character from Same character. The, I just decided to write it. <laughs> the same character, one false move, with so, Bill Paxton in mind. Now the film gets <laughs> it's getting made. Stacy, I forget if she changed it because she wanted Nora Dunn to play the role or she just wanted a woman to play it. Uh, I, I don't remember wh- how Wes became a woman huh. character. But uh, but she did. And, and, then, and then out of nowhere, Bill Paxton gets cast as uh, as, as Zach. Right. Paxton shows up. We didn't know he was going to have a crew cut, which is critical and perfect for the part. He was shooting Apollo 13, so he had the crew cut, which is perfect, oh, right? right? So he shows up. He comes up to me. I, I go, uh, hey, I don't know if you remember me or whatever. And all of a sudden he's like, oh, my God, that's crazy. He goes, I didn't know any of this. He goes, when I, you know, I mean, he remembered me. He didn't know. I, I was Dan Rosen who wrote the script that he just got cast in. But he goes, but I've been dying to ask you, the writer, a question. And I go, what? He goes, the sheriff. Now, by the time he read the script, it wasn't named Wes. It was, but it was Sheriff Stanley or whatever. Uh, and he said, "Is am I? Is the sheriff me? <laughs> did you write the sheriff for me?" And I go, "I did." He goes, "He goes." I go, "The sheriff's name was Wes. It's it, it's Wes." And he was like, "I knew it, man. I knew it." <laughs> so that was like a really great compliment that I had like captured the character enough that by the time he read the script. The character name was not Wes. It was just a sheriff, and I wrote it. So if you ever see One False Move, and then you see The Last Supper shortly after, 
you'll see the sheriff is... I'm going to watch this movie in a completely different light now. Yeah, and in the play version, I change it back and it's, it's a guy. Hmm. And uh, Oh, really? Okay. And the death of... And here's a little thing. In the play and in the, in the original version, Wes is killed at the table. They invite the sheriff to dinner. Uh-huh. And he's killed with a shovel at the table, which um, I, I like better. I, I think it also works better in the play, too. But that, that was the way the sheriff got it in the original. So there's a fringe universe out there where it's the one false move, Last Supper shared, <laughs> cinematic shared universe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. That only now that only me and Bill Paxton knew about. Them. Well, now yeah. everybody. I know everybody. <laughs> yeah. Oh, awesome. So going back to the film and the production of the film, uh, you know, what is that experience like filling out the roles with all these actors who really weren't um, major players at no. the time. Yeah. You know, Cameron Diaz, was, you know, was unknown. Right. She had, well, know. she had done The Mask. Oh, she had done The Mask. She had done The Mask. Okay. So she, that was a big get for us. Yeah. And, you know, Courtney B. Vance is in it. You know, yeah. Who was, he was nobody. Yeah. I mean, not that he was nobody, but I think he, he might have been nominated for a Tony. He'd either done, like, Fences or Six Degrees of Separation mm-hmm. on Broadway, something big. And I remember me, me and he had also did a movie called Hamburger Hill. Oh yeah, great. Did you ever see Hamburger Hill? It, yes, I have. Yeah, yeah, Is yeah. that the Walter Hill? Yeah, uh, no, no, but it's like a Walter Hill movie. Yeah, <laughs> and he had been in that, and he was just great in that. And um, and I remember meeting him, and that was a, that was like a thrill. Uh, I remember meeting him at Lulu's Cafe, and 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 he, yeah, that's right. He had done an August Wilson play, and mm. we sat down, and Stacy was, he she hadn't quite introduced us. He figured out I was a writer. And he just like held up the script, and he was like, like that. He, I said, "Great script." He said, "Great script." Yeah. Uh, and I was like, "Oh my god!" It's the guy that was in an August Wilson play. Just said my script was great. That's like, amazing. Yeah, he's a great guy. Married a beautiful Angela Bassett. And, that's right. Yeah, don't forget. Uh, and then Annabeth Gish. Annabeth Gish. Ron Edler. Edler. Ron El- Eldar. Eldar. Thank you. From Eldar. ER fame. Um, yeah, he went on to do ER. He was. I remember he was dating Juliana Margot. Mm. Mar- Margulis at the yeah. time, who he, he would come to the set. Um, she was great. And then Stacey Tuttle's cousin is Jason Alexander. Mm-hmm. So right, he right, was right, in there. Right, 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 yeah. Ron Perlman worked out at the Hollywood Y where me and Stacey worked out. And Stacey, I think, just approached him at the gym and handed him the script. So, like, this is, like, an amazing fanboy c- cast at film. Like, yeah. like, these are all people that now, you know... I, I would freak out for in any role. And here they're all sitting around this one particular table. Right. And you wanted Janine Garofalo originally for... The, yeah, I've read, it, I've read it with her in mind. So that's interesting. Yeah. So, and I mean... She's the reason the movie got made. Oh, really? Expand, yeah. Uh, expand on I had written it for I had written it for Janine. Uh, there was this producer guy uh, named Larry who was... His father was friends with my father. and My dad was the executive director of the Jewish Committee Center of Baltimore forever. And... His dad was the executive director of, like, the JCC in Dallas or something like that. And he wanted to be a producer. He's like, oh, my son wants to be a writer, blah, blah, blah. And um, he had come to this reading, liked it, gave me some notes. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I didn't agree with the notes, so I didn't do, I didn't do them. But then Janine, uh, after the reading, this movie called Truth About Cats and Dogs came Oh, yeah. And Janine all of a sudden was, What's like, on? the next... Sandy Bullock. Actually, she was the next Sandy Bullock before Sandy Bullock was the uh-huh. next Sandy Bullock. Uh-huh. And she, it looked like she was going to be a big movie star. And we had, she and I were friends from this, I was a stand up from the stand up world. And we were going to have, we had dinner and she goes, Hey, I really want to do your movie. And uh, so I called Larry and I said, Hey, you know, I just had dinner with Janine and she wants to do a movie. He goes, Oh, my, oh, that's different. Because now in his head, Oh, now she's a star. And he said, did you do my notes? And I said, oh, yeah, of course I did your notes. I didn't do his notes. <laughs> and then he read the script, calls me the next day and goes, oh, my God, my notes are really helped. And, like, I, I totally see it. And then he gave it to someone who had some parking lot money from somewhere, like parking garage mm-hmm. magnate money or something. And then slowly the movie uh, got put together. Huh. Interesting. And, but, then- but it was all because Janine said she wanted to do it. Now, then Janine got Saturday Night Live and had to oh, drop out, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. – which to me was not a great. And she turns ended out up being a horrible year for her. Yeah, 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 yeah. I really thought she was gonna. She was on her way, and but I, I, I really do wish. I mean, I loved Cameron was in it, and that really super helped us. But Janine would have brought a whole different thing mm-hmm. to that character. And then now, since it's been done in the play, 
the character Jude, uh, it's a it's a funnier character than within the movie because uh, Stacy, uh, when we changed the we cut one of the roommates who was also funny, a lot of those lines went to the character that her husband Jonathan Penner played, mm. who in the original is kind of a stoic, mm. doesn't talk that much. Well, let's talk about that for a second. Yeah, I mean, what is it like then to have a screenplay that you wrote in 1993? And has slowly been evolving through productions. Uh-huh. Through... Oh, no, well, it wasn't the... doing stage productions until okay. after the movie came T- out. Until after the movie. Yeah. So, okay, movie comes out, and then, you know, it's con- is it, it, it's continuing to change based on performers? How you, Are you inter- changing things around as, as the uh, film uh, pro- progresses? I change it. I, I'll, I, I've updated it. Uh-huh. And, and changed some of the stuff. And I put some stuff that didn't either make it in the movie or... For whatever reason, and, and put it back in, and and up, update some language and things like that. So, is it a, is it the type of film like for you? You're all you're just going to keep working on it for God knows how I, long. Is it always going to continue to evolve? Yeah, like I was saying, it's really hard for me to think about re- doing a rewrite with Donald Trump. Trump. Yeah, um, it's got to happen though. I know it does. <laughs> and and, there, and there's talk of there's now a theater company in LA that's talking about doing it. So I would have to do it for them. Um, I really would like to do it as a television series. Mm. And I think every week it's set on a college campus. Every week they're bringing someone to dinner. It, it would be Dexter mm. meets Crossfire. That's not exactly Crossfire, but you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and the ultimate goal is someone like an Ann Coulter or that Milos guy is coming to campus and they want to figure out a way to kill that guy. Huh. I mean, so they're like stalking people in this town. <laughs> Who are like these right? Like set I'd it. watch that. Yeah, I, I'd watch I that. I think it'd be a great like Amazon streaming show. Well, so when you're writing it originally, and you're you're choosing like, okay, well, I want uh, somebody who's anti-gay rights to be a target. I want somebody who's uh, the, yeah, the, anti-censorship. Like, how do you pick those? Well, that's funny. Now topics? I ju- just had a flashback when I was working in the room. I think I had a list of oh really who are the who are the people I want to kill. Uh-huh. I want to kill the, the you know the. The pro, not pro abortion, the anti. Yeah, pro, the pro life. Yeah, yeah. Pro life person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a list of like the topics of the people, and then I kind of created the character around the topic. Interesting. Okay. All right. So it was like a personal uh, vendetta list. Yes. (laughs) Um, So now here we are. uh, We're about to screen it in Winchester, Virginia. Mm hmm. Uh, do you anticipate audience reactions? Like, or, or are you, or is it a more of a like a delightful uh, prankish yeah. almost experience? I don't. I, I mean, I'm interested to see who's going to come. I, I mean, I know Winchester is supposed to be kind of conservative. Mm-hmm. We spent. I've only spent like twenty four hours here. Uh-huh. It seems pretty hipster. People I met. Uh-huh. A lot of people drive the Subaru. <laughs> certainly us. <laughs> I just took you to certain parts. But. Oh yeah. <laughs> So, I, I mean, and then again, you know, I yeah, we'll be interested to see who, who, who shows up for the screening. Do you ever, do you ever feel like, uh, oh, that was not the right crowd for it, or, or like, uh, no? No. It's just, whatever, whatever comes. Yeah. Okay, all right, cool. So, talking about your tour through Winchester, you just talked to a bunch of kids at a university, right? Shenandoah University. Yeah. I bought a sweatshirt. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, what is it like now talking you know, from a place of, uh, of creative uh, success mm-hmm. to this room full of kids who are who want to achieve what you have achieved. Uh, part of me is like, God, don't don't do this. Uh-huh. Don't follow these footsteps. Uh, the other half is like, I, I so I, I've been teaching. I got my MFA a couple of years ago. I'm a professor of film, or whatever, and I, I've actually become a better writer teaching screenwriting. Mm-hmm. So I, I usually get very inspired by kids who want to go into stuff and and teach. Well, before and you showed up, Andy and I were at the bar and we were having a conversation about you know it's Avengers weekend. Also, is when we're recording yeah. this. Yeah, good timing on the screening, <laughs> by the way. A, a, Avengers weekend. Not heard of it. No, you haven't heard of it, Not Andy. Familiar. Okay, good. That's great. <laughs> You know, the, the landscape, even since 1995, has changed dramatically. Yeah. I mean, so from your point of view, I mean, how are you feeling about filmmaking? You know, you've gone and you've made some movies yourself. Right. You know, uh, the, we were talking about The Curve earlier. Yeah. I love The Curve. Matthew Lillard for life. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, are you feeling good about the industry? Are you feeling despondent? 
They, can they see me cry on the podcast? No, not yet. We haven't gotten to. <laughs> we have a YouTube channel, but we don't oh, have the camera okay. today. Yeah, I I don't know. You never know with it. I mean, I and it's funny. I've been doing this for so long now, so I I, I don't know. You never know what what's happening with the industry. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of people running the show now. I feel I feel like there's a lot of filmmakers out there who are successful be, because they're they're nice people. This is going to come off wrong. <laughs> not that I'm not nice, but it used to be. And I'm not. I'm not. I promise you, I'm not a difficult filmmaker. But people, filmmakers used to be difficult because film artists are freaking difficult people. And now it seems like industry people want to work with people, like they want to be friends with. Like it's like these movie stars and movie directors, like their best friends are like are, are like agents and managers and I'm studio not sure executives. What you mean by it. now it seems <laughs> like it should people want to work Series with people ready. want to be friends with. It's like that is the weirdest. <laughs> That is the weirdest thing. The AIs um, are always listening. Yeah. Always listening. Always listening. So I, it, it, am I making any sense? Like it, it, it I, seems like the industry is, is gearing towards, like, let's make uh, user-friendly films and stuff, and there's not that much stuff that's just – there's really not that much stuff that's that challenging anymore mm-hmm. um, that, that's been coming out lately. And I, I, I think part of it is he's exact. Oh my God! What is happening? <laughs> this has never happened before. For, yeah, always, always. Let me turn this off. So, uh, yeah. So I, I don't quite know. And and by the way, I, I'm not like a difficult filmmaker at all. I'm pretty friendly too. You seem but friendly. It, yeah. Thank you. But it seems like the the films that are coming out are just like they're not you know they're not that exciting. And and some of the filmmakers I admire, I don't think are are pushing the envelope like they used to. And and doing more interesting stuff. So where are you getting your creative drive from now? I, I actually from teaching. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, uh, because you were saying, you know, in educating, you're having to reevaluate your own style and, right. and what have you. Okay, all right, cool. Which, and, and that's also good for me because I, I'm literally teaching the target audience that everybody wants. Right. I'm teaching 18 to 24-year-olds. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So I'm really understanding, like, the language and stuff like that. And I've definitely become a... A better writer. I've been more excited about the stuff I've been writing the last couple of years than for the for a while now. Um, so going back a little bit in time, you know, from the Last Supper, uh, and then to you know the to directing yourself, to directing your own scripts. Right. I mean, what is what was that jump? I mean, how did you feel about that jump? Is that the jump? Like, is that the world you also want to just continue to live in? Yeah, I mean, nothing's more fun than yeah. directing a movie. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I'd love to direct something that someone else hasn't written, but I mean. And especially when you, you know, the key to directing is just hiring the best people you can hire and not have to do anything. I mean, nothing was better than sitting in a chair and having people bring you Diet Cokes. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of like directing. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, I got very lucky. The Last Supper had done so well in France. I know I sound like Jerry Lewis. But it had done so well in France that this French company had made all this money distributing it. And by the way, the, the guy who – it was a guy named Pierre Caffon – who had seen The Last Supper somewhere, like at an AFM thing, and said, I wanted the theatrical rights to it. And uh, the people at Sony had said, oh, no, you you didn't really do well here. You don't want it. And um, he said, no. He said, we'll give you the video rights. And he goes, no, I want to do it theatrically. And ended up playing in one – it played all over, but it played in one theater for two years. And this guy years later told me that the film had made like 50 million worldwide. Now, me and Stacey Title, my friend who directed it, uh, yes, my friend is looking. Uh, <laughs> it made fifty million worldwide. I never saw a penny of that, oh, yeah. but he said foreign. It made like fifty million dollars, and then they came to me and said, "Hey, we'll we'll do anything you want to do as long as you direct it." Hmm. Like they said, I had to direct it so they could save from the because it, you know in France it's like the auteur theory, and right. and everyone thinks the auteur theory is the director. It's not. It's the writer. Mm-hmm. It's the writer director, but it's the writer first. So they came to me and asked me about doing that, and I said I had this idea. The Dead Man's Curve, it was originally Dead Man's Curve, was out of a stand-up bit of mine. Really? Yeah. And then there was that movie Dead Man on Campus that came oh, yeah, out. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I remember being told by somebody who did not know that I was the person they were talking about that they had met with the original writers of Dead Man on Campus, who I believe was not Mike White, the original writer. <laughs> uh-huh. And the person said, oh, really interesting. The, she goes, oh, I met with these writers, and the way they came up with the – movie was really interesting they saw a comedian on mtv half hour comedy hour doing a bit about it and they thought it would make a good movie i was that comedian really? they saw so uh, that's your half hour to 
to Dead Man on Campus. Yeah. And then, ironically, Dead Man on Campus came out the same freaking year. Right. And it's why Trimark had to change the name from Dead Man's Curve, which I thought was a better title than To the Curve. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Yeah. Interesting. And, but did you find the um, creative challenge of directing that different? Well, I mean, obviously it's different, but more satisfying than your experiences on The Last Supper? I mean... Yeah, I mean, it's fun when you're when you have it to yourself but then if you're not if you're the director and the writer you have no one it's all you it, yeah it's all you even if someone else has final cut or someone it's still all it's still you so it's a lot more pressure it's way easier to be the writer and and maybe to be disappointed and there's nothing negative about saying like oh the, the film didn't turn out the way I wanted to because when you're the screenwriter there's no budget in your head mm-hmm. there's no you're gonna have the best cast list in your mm-hmm. head and you're going to see the best people, you know, in those parts. And then reality hits. Now, sometimes reality is even better, but rarely is it reality better. So when The Last Supper comes out and you watch it, I mean, uh, I guess you were, you were there on set with... Oh, Steve yeah, I was there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you were no, and, and Stacy was great. She, uh, so the DP is Paul Cameron. Do you know who Paul Cameron is? I don't. You should Google him. Mm-hmm. Paul Cameron became this... He, it became, he is this huge DP. He did... Um, Oh my God! What did? Were we talking about this in the class? Paul, yeah. Can you look up Paul Cameron real quick? Yeah, yeah. But um, he went on to be like Tony Scott's DP. He did Man oh. on Fire. Really? Yeah. He's. I mean, when you think of Tony Scott films, you're thinking those images in your head you're are thinking Paul Cameron. Him, yeah. And his first film was this little film in a room. Really? Yeah. And he's got all these big, expansive things. Huh. And now, so I, I and uh, so anyway, he was the DP. Huh. And him and Stacey, you know, spent a lot of time. It was her first film, his first film. Spent a lot of time working on it. It's hard doing. That's what I was saying. Thinking, oh, it all takes place in one room, everyone eating dinner. Right. Yeah, no okay, problem. well, that's really hard uh-huh. to shoot yeah. and also to make interesting, which I thought they did a really great job of. But also the eating part is such a continuity nightmare, mm-hmm. which I didn't realize. So in my mm-hmm. second film, Dead Man's Curve, I have a thing that, unfortunately, the production designer screwed up. But I had a thing throughout the movie where – all they have the students eating are power bars and power shakes mm-hmm. because that's the easiest thing to shoot. Mm-hmm. And I, I knew from watching Stacy have to handle, you know, every, every, oh my God, that was the best cut. And then the script supervisor goes, no, Cameron Diaz wasn't using a fork in that last, you're not going to be able to use the take, you know? <sighs> so I realized, all right, no forks, no silverware, no plates, just power bars. You know, the technicalities. Of, <laughs> yeah. Of yeah. You don't think of those. Um, well, so, Okay. Uh, you know, you, going back to the Last Supper, you've been with Last Supper for a long, long time. Yeah, uh, it's you know, do you do you remember your feeling upon the original release, and, and you know, like how you felt about how that film was handled in 1995, like how they distributed, it? yeah, distributed, it, yeah, yeah. That, so uh, I think they ran away. There was a time. I guess still, is there? But it's very hard to market a political movie. Yeah. And Sony didn't even try, like, they didn't even try. They just, they, they kind of market it as kind of a thriller, mm-hmm. which, which is fine. I, I mean, I, I, I remember talking to the people there saying, you know, this is, so it was coming out, let's see, it came out in 96. Uh, but we made it in 94. And then we sold it in 95. Yeah, that's right. And then it started playing, like, the Toronto Film Festival. And we were really lucky. We played films, this doesn't happen anymore. We played... It debuted at the Toronto Film Festival, then it played the London Film Festival, and then it played Sundance. That usually, mm. you don't get to play Sundance when you played those festivals before, right? Mm. And then we played both the Austin Film Festival and South by Southwest. Mm. So we had a lot of fans and playing these great, the, the producers made a big mistake by selling the film way too early. They, and they sold it not at a festival, they sold it before Toronto. Um, at a screening, they did a screening at Paramount. They could have made a lot more money. That was the year that, uh, that movie, uh, something Spitfire Grill, sold oh, for yeah. eleven million. Right, right, right. Like if we had waited till Sundance, we had Cameron Diaz in an indie film, which is kind of unheard of. Mm-hmm. That I think our film would have gone bigger. And then if it had been sold for more money, they would have put more money into the marketing or whatever. So I think they just they weren't sure what they had. I remember saying it's nineteen ninety six. It's an election year. Let's do a bipartisan screening in New Hampshire and do a premiere and give the money to like a by you know women uh democracy movement or something like that but they they, they were like oh politics never sells or whatever and i'm like well why'd you buy the movie then if you thought 
thought right. it wasn't going to sell. Well, but so, you know, it comes out. Now t- we're 20 plus years later. Uh-huh. Um, you know, Birth Movies Death did an announcement uh, for this screening. Evan Sadoff, I think, uh, wrote it. And it's like this this very... Um, it's not to call the cult film's not the, the the right word, but I mean there's a there's a massive fan base around it now. Like I think there's there's an audience there that has built over decades yeah. that didn't show up maybe when it, because of uh, in, in its original release run. Right, and they also weren't born, or they weren't, or they weren't <laughs> born, and, and 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 now you have this film that I feel like because it was the '90s, because it was you know uh, in that era, you could make it. Could you make it now? I, yeah, I would love to make it now. Yeah, I, I would love to make it now, but could you? Yeah. You think so? Yeah. Uh-huh. Trust me, I've thought about, like, is there a way I could just change it just a little bit so it's a slightly different... Like, couldn't you remake it? I mean, couldn't you... I guess so. A bit, I mean, it would. I don't know who exactly has the rights to do it sure, anymore. Sure, sure, sure. Strangely enough, it was a non-WGA thing, and I think I'm actually more protected... Because if it was a writer's guild trip after like seven years, you, they don't owe you anything. Uh-huh. But I think I'm tied to it somehow, and I held on to the playwrights to it. That's why. But I, I think the TV series would be the way to do it now, because it's so much fun, and then you could delve into the characters mm-hmm. more. And it's so I would love to do it like a ten episode arc of it. But at the same time, uh, we're more divided than we've ever have been in this country, which and I think would help. I think it would help know. certainly from an entertainment standpoint. But I, man, boy. I, I, I I can't imagine my in laws accepting this movie, but maybe right. they can. Maybe they're like the the conservatives who think it's a a, a bashing of the liberals too. What? Right? And I did if I did a TV series, I would do the first season. It's the liberals doing this, and then the second season I'd switch it up, and the conservatives are in, inviting the liberals. Oh, well, that's and great it slowly idea. starts changing. Oh man, well, I want that to happen. I hope that can happen. Thank you. Cool. Dan, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Can I, I, have yes. a, I have a great story I've always wanted to Please. tell. I don't know what the segue would be. Maybe I'll tell you the story. Is this the editing. story that we were talking about a little bit earlier? No, no, no. no, no. Okay. <laughs> this is about the, sticking with The Last Supper. Okay, yeah. But it's a crazy small world story. I'll tell you the story, and then you can figure a way to figure, fit ask it me in. something to uh, segue with. Sure, sure. This story I didn't tell you. Did or did not? Did not tell you. Okay. About Prague? I didn't tell you that story. And Perlman? Yeah. It, maybe you did. <laughs> the British guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I did tell you. You okay. told me this. Yes. Right. Well, I want to hear it. It's good so story. this is an incredibly small world story. I'm in Prague. It's 2001. It's four in the morning. I'm drunk, probably on absence, uh, at, a, at a big cavernous bar. And um, walking out of a bathroom, I bump into a guy, kind of a biggish guy. I notice he has a F- hat that says FBI. We both say, excuse me in English. Uh, I look up. It's Ron Perlman. In Prague. In Prague. There is shoot Blade Hellboy. 2. No, Blade 2. Blade 2, okay. Right. Uh, I look at Ron. He's drunk. He looks at me. He's walking in the bathroom. He stops, grabs me by the shoulder, and just says, uh, <laughs> don't, don't fucking say a word until I tell you to speak. He drags me back to this table. Now I'm going to tell you the story from what I'm thinking as I'm there. Uh-huh. He drags me back to the table that clearly he is sitting with these people and is just left for a second. They seem surprised that he's back so fast. Like, I figured that out right uh-huh. away. At the table are the Hughes brothers who are there shooting From Hell with Johnny Depp and Heather oh, Graham yeah. and a couple British actors who I kind of recognize. And I wish I, – I still remember there was one guy that I kind of remember, but now I don't remember what his name was. And Ron Perlman points to this one British actor. I wish I did a better British accent. It would be a better story. Points to the British actor and he says, uh, tell this guy, doesn't introduce me, tell this guy what you said to me. And the guy is a little confused. He goes, oh, I, what? I was just telling Ron here that um, uh, Ron is, uh, happens to star in my favorite American independent film of all time, a little film called The Last Supper. <laughs> and Ron goes, uh, and then what did you say? Well, I was telling Ron, I, I've seen the movie a number of times, at least a dozen. And, but I've always been confused what the writer meant by the end of the movie. And uh, Ron says, well, and then what did you say? He says, well, I, I asked you, Ron. I, I, I said, uh, do you know what the writer meant by the end of the movie? And Ron said, and then what did I say? And Ron said, uh, he said, well, Ron, you, you said you'd be back in a minute with the answer. 
And then Ron turns to me and goes, here's the writer. <laughs> and literally what happened is Ron meant, yeah, you know, I, I kind of know what he meant. I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'll be right back and tell you. He runs into me in the bathroom in Prague in at middle four of the story. in the morning yeah. in the middle of the story of The Last Supper. Okay. And is that your crazy? answer was... Oh, I don't remember that. <laughs> no, I think the guy wanted to know, like, he wanted to know if the roommates were dead at the end of the day. Uh-huh, uh-huh, and I said, uh-huh. yeah, they're dead. Yeah. Oh, But okay. he, he, didn't, he wasn't quite positive they were dead. But is that a cra- the craziest story ever? That is nuts. Yeah. Oh, man. Huh. And the Hughes brothers were there. And the Hughes brothers were there. So now is there uh, how, how would we work that in? So you were, t- we were talking about the past. Uh, Lisa, you got any ideas? How did you bring that in? I don't know. I feel like... Is it standalone? That's kind of like, I think that's a kind of a perfect ending. You end with that story. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah I think you end with that story with Ron Perlman. Yeah. Ron, you know, and Blade 2, by the way, and people who listen to this podcast know that Blade 2 is my favorite comic book movie. Oh, really? <laughs> I love Blade 2. Those are, those are both underrated movies. Oh, I, I, I think Blade 1 is fine. I think Blade 2 is like a comic book masterpiece. And because of Guillermo del Toro and the vision that he brought to that. And also what gets lost a lot in the discussion of Black Panther Mm-hmm. I mean, I wonder if Wesley Snipes is sitting at home going, uh, hey, motherfuckers. Yeah, he, oh, he most certainly is. Yeah. And he has come out and said, like, I had a Black Panther script. Where was my Black Panther movie? Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and Blade was a big... And, and Blade was... was successful. Yeah. Yeah. And it was yeah. great. It was and he massive. was great. Yeah. Wesley Snipes was great. Yeah. Did you guys play Blade 2 at the Alamo? Not with the original. Uh, the, well, the, the one Loudon did, Andy. Sometimes they do. <laughs> sometimes they do these things. Well, uh, Dan, thank you so much for chatting with us today. Oh, I, my I, pleasure. I, I super appreciate it. I'm really excited to watch this movie now. Oh, thanks. Like I said, it's been a little while, and uh, I just think it's like, it's the, the 2018 movie I need. Oh, thank yeah, you. So hopefully get that TV show going. Yes. All right, thank cool. you. Thanks, man. And scene. And there you go. We're back in the Dork Cave. My thanks to Dan Rosen for taking time out of his day to chat with me. Of course, again, my thanks to Andy Garrison for setting it up. I thought that was a, a really good chat. And, you know, watching The Last Supper after this conversation, I got to say, it is a film of today. I'd love to see it receive a bit more of a resurgence. Or like Dan said, I, I'd like to see a TV show spun out of this universe. Uh, you know, fingers crossed to see if he can make that happen. I think that uh, it will certainly stir the pot uh, culturally and politically. Um, yeah. So I, I I encourage you to check out the original film and, uh, you know, tweet us uh, at ItModcast. Let us know what you think about the, the movie. And please follow... Dan at Dan Rosen Reads on Twitter and Instagram. Check out his uh, website, rosenreads.com. Uh, he offers his uh, service as a screenwriter to all you budding uh, 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 filmmakers out there. And, you know, follow me on uh, all social medias at Mouth Dork. Follow my fellow dorks. You know, I, I really hope you never have to suffer a solo Mouth Dork episode again. So... Uh, contact you know Disco over at at the Disco Dork on all social medias. Let him know that uh, we, he should never allow Brad alone in the Dork Cave ever 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 again. Uh, follow Wife Dork at Sidewalk Siren. Follow her new baking blog at Bake Dork. Follow the Turtle Dork at the Turtle Dork. Is it one? I don't know. I can't keep track of all his uh, socials. So just you know, find Brian Young. He's out there. He's on Instagram. He's on Letterboxd. He's on Facebook. Um, And, you know, Billy, he really wanted to be a part of this conversation and was unable to make that happen. So go chastise him at WBDAS on Twitter. And, uh, yeah, let me know what you thought about this conversation. And, uh, you know, we've got a bunch more interviews coming your way. It's an exciting year for uh, the In the Mouth of Darkness podcast. Stay tuned. And until next time. (laughs) 